My name is Adam, and wherever I go, I like to ask people questions. And so I thought in this run up to the 2019 general election, it would be fun to meet people from all across the political spectrum and see what they say about different issues and find out if politicians are really as bad as the media would lead us to believe. So, welcome, Stefan Ackner. Thank you very much. And uh, this is this is a bit of an experiment to to meet some of the uh, the people running for the different political parties. Yeah. And uh, and you are a liberal democrat. I am. Yes. Yes. And I running am. in Mid Norfolk. Mid Norfolk, which is Deerham, Wyndham, Attleborough, Watton, and all the places around. I'm particularly interested in the liberal democrats because uh, you know, with. If you just brush over political theory, you know what the Conservatives will think about X, and you know what the yeah, Labour yeah, yeah. moderate left will think about. But I never know what the Liberal Democrats. That is think. a really good point, and you've articulated the problem we have very well. I mean, what which are you is for? That, um, I think on those terms, in terms of like, you know, the Tories like small state, big business. Labour likes big state, you know, small business. Um, it's quite hard to put us on that sort of spectrum. I guess on that term. We are progressives, so we don't think there is really the right answer to any problem sort of permanently, constantly trying to improve how things are. And it might be that at some points um, it's right to try and introduce competitive market dynamics to something. At other times it might be better for the state to step in and take control. Interesting. But believing very strongly, as I do, that um, if, if the state institutions are just as capable of taking on power and holding on to it and acting in their own interests as big businesses are. So you can't trust one solution forever for anything. Ah, that's cool. Uh, that must be quite a marketing problem, though. It's a huge marketing problem. Yeah, bollocks to Brexit is much easier when it comes to <laughs> yeah. lines, which of course is what we're known for at the moment. Yeah. Um, I think for, for me, it is about power and it's about where power lies. And I think for me personally, the thing which is when I read all the manifestos and um, chose which party I wanted to stand for, um, the stuff that really stood out to me was about the redistribution of power mm. and wanting to take it away from people who've inherited it and obtained it through, say, institutional inertia and give it back to the people that are affected by it. And that's something which is really personal to me too. Okay, that's interesting. So do you, like, uh, I'll move quickly on, but do you, yourself, are you, you know, have you been, uh, uh, parts of your life a socialist more then? Or? Uh, I've actually never been a socialist okay. really, which is, which is a very shocking thing to say, especially as my first and actually only boss always said um, that stupid quote that isn't his, but if you're not a socialist by the time yes. you're 21 you haven't got a heart and if you still are only after 21 you haven't got a brain, uh, all this sort of rubbish. I mean, I had <laughs> perfectly good time and say things to say about socialists. I just don't think it's the right solution. Uh, it's just my personal view. So. I have always been a Liberal Democrat. I have been since I could vote. Um, I didn't really get actively involved until the coalition when I thought, oh, this is going to go badly. Okay. Um, yeah. you went like, I know what big good. boys are like. Big posh boys, they're nasty. <laughs> they're going to be horrible to us. So <laughs> that's when I got sort of a bit more actively involved and started to um, mostly by volunteering and, and uh, giving money to help um, in places like North Norfolk. Mm. I think when when Brexit happened, that's when I thought, right, um, I need to put myself forward and try and step mm. in and do something because it's not so much because of Brexit or even the political system. It's that the people in it are shit mm. and not all of them. And there are good people on all sides. There's people in other parties who I'd frankly vote for if I was in their constituency. Mm. But it's not exactly what you would call an attractive career choice. No. And there's a bunch of us in Norfolk right now who are my age standing for the Liberals because we think that a clean sweep is what's needed. Well, how old are you? 35. 35? Oh, yeah. yeah. That's the same age as me? I look a lot older and uglier than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I actually think you be younger than me. Okay, so right. Congratulations. Oh, oh, it's, uh, very nice I'm insane. very young. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> But I think, you know, it's, if you can't beat them, join them. It's sort of the truth, actually. Yeah, that's cool. Um, so you're standing in Mid-Norfolk which with uh, against uh, George Freeman. That's who's right. like the Mike Tyson of, of Tories. Yeah, he Norfolk. has an enormous majority. Yeah. A completely unscalable majority. And and he's like, and I meet people who are like, who are like, oh, no, I don't like the Tories, but I do like George Freeman. Mm. Though not so much now, lately, because yeah. uh, he's like super toes the line. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm not going to say anything at all about my <coughs> opponents. Um, that's for them to, 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 to say. What I do think is that people in Britain are sick of politicians. And if someone comes along who isn't a politician and says, look, I really am doing it for this and this and this reason, 
I'm doing it because I kind of feel the same as you do. Uh, she was like, I've decided that if I can't beat them, I'm going to join them mm. and stop throwing things at the telly. Um, <laughs> then I think they're, they're very interested in what that looks like from a non-party political point of view. I mean, some mm. people will vote for me because of we're the only party with a clear Remain policy. Mm. Uh, a lot of people will not vote for me for that very reason. Yeah. So it's not really about party politics at some level. Um, and there's this Norfolk phrase, speak as you find, which I think is actually how a lot of people in Norfolk vote. Okay, so for you, or for the party, yeah. if you were speaking uh, to, uh, to everyone in the UK at this stage, um, what is the most important thing about this election? Well, Brexit is the most important issue about this election. I think the most important thing about this election is what relationship do we want to have with politicians in the future? Mm. And I think we need a new kind of politics which kind of resets the conversation. Mm. We've understandably derided and ostracised politicians for various reasons, good, bad and ugly. Yeah. Um, if we're going to solve any of the big problems that we're facing as a society, whether that's global forced migration or, most importantly, the climate emergency, we have to be able to have a conversation about what our vision for the future of society actually is. At the moment, things are so disconnected between policymakers and populations that that conversation is not happening. And we don't have a society to think about if we don't fix the climate emergency. Interesting. So that um, actually kind of, on the macro scale, is the biggest... Is, is the I, I, it's biggest. the single biggest issue of our time, so it's getting completely swept under the carpet by Brexit. Mm. One of the reasons that I'm passionate for Remain is not because I love the EU institutions. Uh, it's very hard to be passionate about something which you believe is, is so in need of reform, which I do. Mm. It's because I think that every other problem needs us to be part of the only global idea that actually has social justice at its heart. You can't have climate justice without social justice and vice versa. And there are three, four, maybe five big ideas in the world from Russian kleptocopic capitalism to you know, the American version to the Chinese version. <laughs> and there's the European Union. And we're going to have to be affiliate members of one of those clubs. Mm. And, and I would rather we were an affiliate member of the flawed but genuine attempt to create social justice um, that the EU stands for and no others do. Yeah. That's cool. Nice sense. You're a pro. <laughs> I'm not. I'm just really passionate. So I'm just really, really sick of the, the lies. It's so awful because I don't think the people who voted Brexit are stupid or misinformed, actually. I just think that the truth is the truth is a function of perception. And there is a perception that the problems in this country with lack of resources and lack of access to GPs and mm. lack of jobs and opportunities are caused by... Um, immigration, which they're not, they're caused by conservative policy. Mm. So <laughs> lack of investment? Lack, so of, lack, of, lack, of, uh, lack of funding? Of, lack of care. Okay. You know, there, there, is no, there is no lack of funding. Austerity mm. is a complete myth. The answer to it is not to take over everything with the state, although I would support renationalisation of the railways. Yeah. <laughs> um, the answer is to reset the conversation, discuss what we actually think our vision for society is, and invest in the choices we need to make together to do that whether that's changing the tax system, changing the amount of taxation, we could start by actually upholding the current tax legislation and collecting tax from the people that owe it and don't pay it. Um, and that would get us quite a long way, actually, towards funding the sorts of things we might need to do. But no, I, 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 um, I, I don't think it's about being misinformed, but I do think there have been a lot of things fed into the conversation that are just, just completely untrue. Um, mm. And again, you only give an account of that with a real conversation with somebody. You can't just shout louder with your opinions. So austerity, the idea of austerity is that debt, I mean, we're paying lots of interest on debt. And yeah. so therefore, we can get rid of that. Then we'll have more money in the future to spend on yeah. stuff. Yeah. And uh, so doesn't that then mean, um, uh, so you said that, uh, yeah. So what is the solution? Well, there's, there's, not... there's borrowing to meet your monthly outgoings because yeah. you haven't got enough coming in to pay the bills. And then which is where we are now. Which right? is where we have been in the past. And yeah, my party was in coalition and there was a need in order to preserve Britain's, um, I suppose, states within the financial system. Mm, credit rating. Now, that's not exactly a given. Uh, money is actually a technology. We can do what we like with technology. We could completely change the rules if we wanted mm. to. We'd have to do it with a lot of other people's consent and approval. So, yeah, we can't just sort of throw away the system. We also might need capitalist capitalism at the moment to expedite technology innovation. That's a whole separate thing. Um, there's the other sort of borrowing, which is you need to get to work so you can earn your salary doing your job. And to do that, you need a car. And so you need to borrow 30 grand to buy a new car, mm. um, particularly a new car that is um, ecologically efficient. 
So you can't this save that. Analogy here. This is an analogy. Yeah. Isn't it? You can't you can't save that money up if you can't, can't get to the job, right? Mm. So there is always a case to be made for investment in infrastructure, in stuff that's going to take us forward as a society. So something gives a return. Yeah, or, or just takes us to where we want to get to. Mm. Um, and I have absolutely no problem borrowing tens or hundreds of billions of pounds to put the infrastructure in place that is going to mean this country is a place where people can thrive regardless of the circumstances of their birth. Mm. Um, even better if it creates economic benefits too. But, but the main thing I'm interested in investing in is the stuff that makes life less unfair. Mm. Um, because you only, that's only going to work if, uh, if, if actually the job you're going to is paid. Yeah. Like if it's a great enriching volunteer job and you've just borrowed 30 grand on a car, then you might be screwed. Indeed, and I am hugely pro universal basic income. I think it provides the sort of injection of other riches and benefits into society that's been sorely lacking from the last few three generations of fixation with economic growth. Mm. Um, that doesn't. I don't get excited about economic growth when I get up in the morning. I don't think many people die thinking how happy they are that they've contributed towards economic <laughs> growth. Um, but yeah, this is clearly not the main main purpose of society. You've noticed this. Yeah, right? yeah. No one ever talks about that. No, thing. no, they're very rarely. So I think you know. Clearly, if everybody could live at a certain level without having to um, subvert themselves to someone else's profit, mm. then that would be a great position for us to do unlock th- all sorts of things. Do you think that would make the world a better place? Do you think you would get lots of... Because in the Victorian times, well, vicars used to be able to you know, go butterfly catching because they could tender out their vicaring to someone else and then that was like that, wasn't it? So, well, we already, that we, happen? Well, it's already happened because we already have an enormous labour force in this country keeping us going, which is unpaid, which is the uh, the caring workforce and, to be honest, most parents who yeah. don't work, most of whom are female still. So we already have a society that is absolutely dependent on unpaid labour. Okay. Um, so it's not a case of change, it's a case of um, just re- re- rebalancing, frankly. Uh, and that's a whole different uh, a whole really distraction. Yeah, yeah I'm really no, this is, in the this is not normal either. doorstep talk in mid Norfolk, but no, it could easily be. You never know. What the thing that's so fun about door knocking is you never know what's behind the door or who's behind the door. Yeah. yeah, and it's rarely rude or aggressive. It's more likely to be totally surprising. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose that is a benefit of being seen as the super moderate ones is that uh, you know tend to get people extremely well, yeah, moderate. Yeah, yeah. Very moderate. <laughs> not, not over Brexit. We're rabid over Brexit. Yes, but, that's but true, there yeah. you go. That's that's the pinup for that. So Joe Swinson, yes, is, uh, is is your is your new commander in chief. Yes. And uh, what? How do you how do you feel about her? Uh, I think she looks bloody different to the other usual club of men who are parading around the political mm. spotlight at the moment. And for that reason alone, I think it's fantastic. Mm. Um, I think it's pretty sad that as a party, it's taken us longer than most to mm. get our representation in order. I also don't think that it's just about the optics, though. I think that if you really want politicians to represent people more broadly, and clearly it would be impossible for them to represent people directly, there aren't enough permutations. But if you wanted to increase diversity of representation, then you have to look well beyond gender and ethnicity. You have to look at social backgrounds and class. And that's the thing which I think nobody has really cracked. Um, okay. Even Labour has been a little bit uncomfortable with how it's, you know, how it's dealt mm. with that over the, over the past. A lot of the schisms within Labour, I think, are actually a, a fairly old school working class versus sort of mm, progressive yes, middle totally, class yeah. schism. And um, you know, parties that want to represent people need to think about how they're going to encourage nurses to become candidates, to become MPs, to become health secretaries. Mm. And that's not a yeah, path you can cool. imagine, is it, at the moment? No, especially not if you're the type of person that likes caring for people and being. I mean, well, in fact, I mean, it should be, but uh, but yeah. Being really, on the front line. Be, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But, but look, the fact is that to stand as a candidate, unless you're going to get parachuted into a safe seat, um, you need time, which yeah. means you, you can't work yeah, full time. Yeah. You, know, you can't get elected from a low standing position without time. And you need to want to do that as your main life goal. Yeah. And to give up the other things that you've worked your life for. Yeah. And to Stupid, uh, eh? Yeah. My friend Ben is standing in Broadland as the Lib Dem candidate and he quit his career as an RAF wing commander to do it. Wow. Which is pretty serious. Yeah. Um, but just basically couldn't couldn't go on tour again. Um, felt like he needed to Yeah. Yeah. Go go in and fix the problem. Yeah, that's quite. Yeah, I mean, that's quite a big commitment if you're, especially if you're not expected necessarily to to, to get in. <laughs> yeah, he will. <laughs> oh, okay, that's cool. I really think he will. Yeah, so uh, I mean, that's a good point because. Um, oh yeah, just on the Joe Swinton thing. Yes, yeah, sorry, uh, I didn't really answer your question, did I? Yeah, well, that's okay. You might be a politician next year. So. Uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> vying for a place in her cabinet. <laughs> no, look, I don't actually. I, I, I really subscribe to the belief that you have to know somebody to talk about them. Okay. Um, I don't know her, so I can't really That's pass cunning. judgment. Because um, you know, the next thing I'm going to ask is that uh, she followed the Tory whips on 850 votes between 2010 2015, apparently. Uh, she definitely wouldn't have followed the Tory whips. No. She would have followed the Liberal Democrat whip, um, which may have been. Um, Which was blue of, that period, I believe. Well, yeah, well, possibly, but you've got to remember that the Liberal Democrat members were the ones that agreed the coalition, mm -hmm. that agreed the coalition agreement. So that was our policies. I'm not going to defend the coalition in every instance, mm -hmm. but it wasn't, um, you know, it wasn't a blue washing. It was an interesting decision, which has had a fairly foreseeable consequence on mm -hmm. us for some time. I think we've recovered from it, actually. Yeah, weirdly, um, yeah. I think Brexit's quite, gone quite down, you guys. Good. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather find a more long-term, progressive, sort of visionary thing. Than yes. that. Not just a kind of uh, standing for rejecting something. But, um, no, I think, I think, I think that, that was... So if she voted a lot in the same lines as Conservatives, that's because we were in government with them. Mm. You know, to not do that would have been to cause the coalition to collapse. And, you know, you don't go into something thinking well, we'll see how it goes for the first six months, we can mm. always quit. You know, that was, that was the only full-term parliament in the recent political history. Yes. Yeah. And it got some good things done as well as some terrible things. I think to see what happened as soon as, as, soon as we were out of that under Cameron, uh, immediately all the green initiatives were shuttered straight away. Mm. Um, universal credit has been brought in. Um, yeah, huge, mm. huge illiberalism and, and injustice on everything from immigration to mental health. Mm. And all that stuff was protected while we were there. Um, yeah, so I so I won't defend it yeah. universally, but I'll defend it on the grounds that yeah, if we we would do what what we'd agreed, if we'd agreed it, and it was the members that would have agreed it. Yeah, that's interesting. oh yes, yeah, so, and uh, yeah, this is one of the things that was quite interesting. Someone was saying about, and this probably isn't, or well, certainly not from your uh, in your situation, but uh, but in lots of, I guess, are you guys going for the full six hundred and fifty seats? Not quite. Not quite. Okay, uh, we're going for enough to be able to run the country. Okay. We never ever, I mean, only the Tories actually field in every seat in the election. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, even Labour don't always. Oh, okay. Their policy is to, but they don't always manage to. Is that because the deposits are too expensive? <laughs> 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 It's not as bad as Police and Crime Commission. It's three grand for the Police and Crime Commission. Is it really? Yeah. It's strange because that's yeah. Anyway, right. So with the so going. Sorry. Uh, yes. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> I am very distractible. I mean, uh, <laughs> Sorry, I'm really giving me a hard time. What was the question again? The, yeah. So with the in South Norfolk, uh, in South Norwich. Yes. Uh, you guys will be going up against Clive Lewis, who yep. is uh, who is pretty Remainy, isn't he for yeah. um, uh, for, for Labour. a Labour candidate? Yeah. And uh, so, are there times like that so, uh, that you would ask, say, well, why are we why are we going against here? Because you know we're going to be able to get a Remainer in, and that's what we're. So we have set we have set political history in our deal with the Greens this week, or uh, in the last week. Okay. In that we have come up with a um, mutual pact with the Greens for over sixty seats, and that has meant putting. Uh, yes, candidates, I saw this in negotiation. Yeah, hard, hard working candidates who have worked maybe for years mm. to build up the seat with their name behind it, saying to them, thank you, but we're going to let this other person from a different party stand instead. And that's big stuff, right? That, that, yeah, that, that doesn't happen in politics. That's, that doesn't happen in politics much. I think it's a mark of um, uh, quite how important it is to both us and the Greens mm. to get what we think is right <laughs> for this country done. Labour, for better or worse, have always refused to not field a candidate. So we can't do pacts with them. Mm. Um, they, I, I understand why, but they they won't stand down anywhere. Mm. So obviously we can't we can't just randomly just stand all your stand people, all people down. No. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that. So what's happening in South Norwich then? Uh, it's going to be a four way, I think. So is there going to be a Green and a Liberal Democrat candidate? Uh, I don't know about that because it's. It, I don't think it was high enough on the list to get the sort of you know sixty seat deal headlines. Oh, okay, yeah. I mean, we'll all know on Thursday because that's yes. when nominations are yeah. announced. Um, but it looks like it's going to, as it has been before, be a kind of an all way seat, which at least will put the cameras onto Norwich for a bit. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you were saying about um, Jo Swinson being uh, important that she's a female leader in, the, in a wash of, uh, of male leaders but interesting Caroline Lucas obviously is uh, indeed she is and um, and uh, co -leader. Sturgeon well and Sturgeon Sturgeon is leader of a female leader of a political party in the UK yeah absolutely and I would rather the debates had as many different viewpoints as possible mm. I'm actually you know I'm a big believer in electoral reform I think it is the part of the system that needs to change yeah because I guess that's that doesn't get talked about no I guess yeah, I, it doesn't I, get talked about I, much nowadays I don't know about you but I'm, I'm not worried about uh, 10 UKIP or 20 Brexit party MPs getting elected into parliament 
Mm. Um, apart from that, I think they will not do a very good job by the people that voted them in and they'll get to see. Mm. I think it's trying to suppress that voice that has led partly to where we are in the first place. Mm. You, know, you can't tell people that in the millions their votes don't count. Mm. Um, I don't mean that as a sort of trap for, oh, well, you had the referendum in 2016. We'll have that argument if you want separately. But you know, every time there's an election, a minority candidate is going to contribute to the national vote share, but contribute nothing to representation. Mm. And I'm not afraid of there being dozens of different voices. I believe in political plurality. And the same with debates. I'd rather see all seven party leaders up on stage. Mm. It is yeah. pretty shambolic that certain broadcasters have not included Joe in their um, main debates, though, because although we are a smaller party, mm. um, we are standing with the only clear position on the number one issue amongst the electorate. Yeah, that's interesting. Isn't it? Yeah, I can see why they... They do that, and then they would, uh, yeah, because you know, you let one person, you let others in, and then I mean, because they would then be like, Well, we better have Farage on as well because he's well, going to be the main great. voice against, and yeah, maybe he maybe they should. Um, but to not exercise that sort of journalistic principle mm. and say, Well, we're here to re reflect the argument based upon the parliamentary arithmetic of the past, mm. even though what we're going into is a choice about the parliamentary arithmetic of the future. Mm. Surely that should reflect the discussion that people are having. And, and the May election was really like, that was not a two party horse at all. Indeed, it was not. And a we, two horse. you know, <laughs> two party, yeah, whatever the Lib Dem always <laughs> yes. do a bar chart, don't they? It's always only the Lib Dems can win. Yes, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. I've just got that leaflet over That me. is a shocking lie. Uh, <laughs> sometimes other parties are eligible to win. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, um, it, it, it is, it's surprising. And not all broadcasters have taken that view, of course. Okay, so, so coming into land, uh, yes. if you were going to speak directly to the people of Mid-Norfolk yeah. in their little rural communities and dairy places, uh, what would you like to say to them? I think I'd like to say that we're entering into a world where anything is possible, both electorally and frankly in terms of our lives, and what we need to make that possible is connectivity. It's the number one issue is that our rural towns and villages are too disconnected, we need a proper networked public transport system that is also zero carbon. We need broadband and mobile connectivity into all our communities. And if we can do that, I think it will give people in Mid-Norfolk much more choice about how they lead their lives. And that ultimately, I think, is part of my job as a candidate to be your MP. That's really cool. So actually, before we go, not because that was any... like I, I asked for a lot of questions yeah, yeah. on my Facebook and, uh, and buses didn't come up, but... Uh, your buses are quite boring, but, but yeah, yeah, no, I guess so. But not electric buses are awesome. Electric buses are awesome, <laughs> and, and, and what we need is like is basically the park and ride, but with all the stop, all the car parks way, way further out of the city. Okay. So the idea is you drive, possibly your electric car, possibly your old diesel banger, and you park it in the car park, and then you get on a bus, that takes you into Norwich or takes you into Deerham. Okay. And so it's a, it's a sort of hub and spoke model where you're doing maybe three quarters of the journey by bus. What that also means is that little electric buses can pick people up in the sort of routes around the hubs and mm. spokes where there aren't people that have cars. So rather than trying to get a sort of rural bus that takes three hours and goes to every village all the way into yeah. Norwich, you're bringing people to a, to a central place and you're taking them in. Same for stations. A um, few solar panels on the roofs might be able to give people some discounted charging and it starts to pay itself. So, you know, it really isn't that expensive. Mm. Money's out there, but we need leadership to go and get it. That's the problem, is that um, Norfolk is a quite a blue place, electorally speaking. Uh, it's taken for granted. This is where they send Tory MPs that have done their good work and they send them here to get elected easily yeah. and um, this is why stuff doesn't get done.